Turn in your Bibles to John, chapter 6. I'm going to finish chapter 6 today. Beginning in verse 59, looking at the topic of words of eternal life. Obviously, that would be sort of important, wouldn't it? These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Uh, Jesus had pretty much made Capernaum his home. Uh, if you'll look through here and look at where his miracles done, many, many, many of his miracles we see were done back in Capernaum. He kept, it's like, it's like he kept, he went out, he never got too far from home, if you'll look, really look at the scriptures and look at the map. Jesus probably never got over 30, 40 miles away from his home from the time he was born until the time he was crucified. All of his ministry took place in just a little area, but he kept migrating back, it looked like. He kept migrating back to Capernaum. So he goes back to Capernaum. He's in the synagogue. And therefore said, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Now, we talked about the statement all last week. When you know, But eat my flesh, drink my blood, and explain what that meant. But they said, this is a difficult statement. And they ask a serious question, who can listen to it? There's an answer to that question. You know, anybody can listen to it, but who can hear it? There's a difference between listening to it and hearing it. Um, You could have people sitting in the services, and if you had a thousand people there all listening to the same message, you could have a thousand people listening to the message, but... That doesn't guarantee that a thousand people are going to hear the message. That's right. And the message that Jesus just gave and what we're going to talk about today, who can listen to it? Everyone. Who can really hear it? Only true believers. Only people who are really seeking after God's word can really hear it. Jesus did this a lot. Jesus spoke in parables. Jesus told a lot of messages. He did a lot of things that were meant for people who were really seeking after him. That's why the Bible says three times throughout the Bible, always in the Old Testament, it says, when you seek for me with all your heart. Folks, you can't walk close to God in a casual relationship. He won't allow it. He, now, he said, if, he's not hiding. And he said, if you really seek for me, if you really want to know me, you can find me. I'm here. I'm here for you. And I'll reveal myself to you. But you have to really want him. So he says, the disciples said, this is a difficult statement. Well, yes, it was a difficult statement. Did, did, does Jesus ever say anywhere in the scriptures that this Christian walk that we're living is going to be easy? I believe he said just the opposite, didn't he? I believe he said something about we would be persecuted. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Well, if the devil's not bothering you, you're not bothering the devil. It's real simple. So it is a difficult statement. But then Jesus said, conscious of what his disciples grumbled about, said this to him. What well, does this cause you to stumble? The fact that it's hard, that it's difficult? He, he, he might be saying to him, hey, well, you don't understand because you haven't asked. He said, if you would just ask what it meant, I'd be glad to explain it to you, but nobody's asked yet. You know, they were just talking about, well, this is a difficult statement he made. How are we going to do that? Well, he's standing right here. You want to know how to do it? Ask him. Jesus said, you haven't asked me. What did James say? You know, James said, if you ask. He said, what if you, you, you say, is this going to cause you? Are you going to stumble? Are you going to give up? Are you going to fall by the wayside? James said, if any of you lacks wisdom, just let him ask of God, who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's one of the things I pray for every day, that God would give me godly wisdom and discernment. Now, you can have all the wisdom in the world. If you don't have a discernment to go with it, it's sort of useless. You know, Solomon had all the wisdom in the world. So he was the wisest man that ever lived, and his discernment wasn't too good. If you look at all the things he did and all the mistakes he made in his 40 years of being king and his short life that he lived, He made a lot of mistakes. So you can have wisdom. Now, we have a lot of stuff today that's called wisdom. It's really intelligence. And there's a a myriad of differences between wisdom and intelligence. Mm -hmm. 
I know some people that have all the intelligence in the world. And they're smart when it comes. To, they're they're smart in their field, and they're dumber in a coal bucket outside their field. So there's a difference. He said we can have wisdom. He didn't say intelligence. He said we could have wisdom. He said, what then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was? Now get this, where he was before. If you see the Son of Man, Jesus, ascending to where he was before. Before what? Before the incarnation. Now there's some religions out here that want to teach that Jesus came into being when he was born in Bethlehem. When he was born to Mary, he came into being. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said he was before Abraham. He says very clearly here. He's going to talk about going back to where he came from. So obviously Jesus said, I didn't come into being. I just became into being as a man here. But he existed before that, and that's what he's going to point out to him. He said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And the words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. We studied a few weeks ago back in John chapter 3 um, and, and verse 12. He said, if I told you earthly things you don't believe, how would you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So he said, you, it must be the Spirit who teaches you. He said, I, I've been telling you things, real simple things, that you should be able to understand. Remember when Paul talked to him in the Corinthians about, he talked to the Corinthian church about, he said, you ought to be feeding on meat by now as long as you've been Christians. And you're still on milk. You know, you start a baby out on milk. You start a baby out on meat, you're going to choke it to death. A baby starts out on milk, and then they progress up to solid foods. And that's what Jesus said. He said, I've been giving you things, simple things in earthly terms, and you don't even understand them. How are you going to understand when I try to give you heavenly things, like we spoke about last week, and like he speaks about here? But these words are important. That's why the message is words of eternal life. He said, it's the flesh profits nothing. Now, let me just point this out. As you know, and we've talked about it before, the Catholic Church teaches something called transubstantiation, big word which means that when you take the Lord's Supper, that when you eat that wafer, you're actually eating his real flesh. And when you drink that wine, you're actually drinking his real blood. There's somehow or another, Jesus' flesh and blood get into that. They take that literally. Well, if that were true, which it's not, but if it were true, look what he says here. The flesh profits nothing. So if, if they were actually were eating his flesh, what did Jesus say? How much good would it do them if they actually were? None. They overlooked that. He said it wouldn't do you any good if you really were. The words that I've spoken up to you are spirit and life. Now, Paul addressed this in 1 Corinthians, two different verses. 1 Corinthians 2.14, when Paul was talking to him, he said the natural man doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. And folks, don't you know that? How many times have you tried to share something with somebody, a natural person, a person who's not been born again, they don't have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit living in them, and you try to explain something to them that to you is fairly simple. It's not complicated. It's what the Bible says. It's not complicated. And it's just, they, they don't get it at all. They don't understand it. In fact, the best they'll do is argue with you. But, the, but they don't understand it. But that's natural. Paul said that's natural. The person, until you receive the Holy Spirit, that's why the Bible says you've come by faith. We're saved by faith through grace. That not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. We have to be saved by faith. Now, we we don't have that faith. Jesus gives us that faith. The Holy Spirit draws us. But we have to come by faith because the Bible also says that no man searches after God. Isn't that amazing? We don't search after God. The Bible says God searches after us. God seeks those who are lost. The parable of the sheep and the shepherd. That little sheep that got lost... He didn't come back looking for the shepherd. The shepherd left the 99 and went after the one. Isn't it amazing that the God of the universe, the God that created you and me, the God that spoke everything into being, 
loves us so much that even when we're running from Him, even when we're hiding from Him, even when we're rejecting Him, He's still seeking after us to seek and save those that are lost. He said, that's why I came. To seek and save those that are lost. That's you and me. Paul went on to say in the next verse in 1 Corinthians, He who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. So he said, if you're spiritual, you can appraise these things. You can you make an appraisal. You look at something. You make you check. You decide what it is. You figure out what it is. You make an appraisal. You un, you come to understand it. He said, those who are spiritual can appraise all things. In other words, once you have the Holy Spirit. By the way, once you have the Holy Spirit, you're no smarter than you used to be. You're no better than you used to be. You're just a lost sinner saved by grace. The difference is, once the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. You will understand things that you never understood before. You could have a, go back to intelligence. You could have all the intelligence and the world. I know people that memorize this book. I know some people that can give you this book word for word. I know one in particular. I know he's a friend of mine. He's got the book memorized. I can give him, I can give him a scripture, uh, any chapter I want to, and he can quote me the whole chapter. Oh, I wish I could do that, but I can't. But, but, even though you can't do that, the Bible makes a promise. The Bible says that if you give your heart to Jesus Christ, the Bible says if the Holy Spirit is living within you, that the Holy Spirit will teach you. If you're willing to be taught. Now, he won't, God's a gentleman, and he will not force it on you. But if you're willing to be taught, if you want to learn, you just simply ask. James says you have not. Why? Because you ask not. If you will ask, and you will ask God, the Holy Spirit, would you teach me? I'm, I'm studying this. I'm trying to learn this. I don't understand it. What does it mean? And then go back and study it again. I didn't say go back and read it. Go back and study it again. The Holy Spirit said he'll teach you. He's our teacher. And once you receive the Holy Spirit, there's nothing in this Bible, nothing whatsoever in this Bible that you cannot understand once you receive the Holy Spirit because he's our teacher and he teaches us. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now, he dealt with this constantly, and he's still dealing with it today. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. He knew this in, in advance. He said, For indeed we have good news preached to us, just as they also did. But the word they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith in those who heard. People who listen just to be listening. Folks, y'all can sit here and be hearing the message this morning, and it may speak to your heart. God may just come out and speak to your heart. You can have somebody sitting right beside you hear the same message and walk out of here and say, well, I didn't get anything today. Didn't speak to me. Well, first of all, as was said this morning in Sunday school, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And if you're not listening, if you're not asking, if you're not expecting God to speak to you, right. the chances are very slim that he will. Amen. But if you come through that door expecting to meet with God, Amen. you don't just come to sit and soak. You come to meet with God. Yes. If you come to meet with God, God will meet with you. Amen. He will teach you. He wants to teach you. He's not trying to hide this from you. He said these are words of eternal life. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. He knew the ones that had head knowledge, but their heart had never changed. They had the head knowledge. Now, you know people like this. They know just enough of the Bible to get them in trouble. They know just enough of the Bible to argue with you. But they don't know the person who wrote the Bible. And folks, you can know this, you can know this book by heart. But if you don't know the writer... You're lost. Amen. Knowing this book will not save you. That's right. Knowing the writer saves you. Because Jesus wrote it. The Holy Spirit wrote this Bible. Amen. Back in Psalms, all the way back in the Old Testament in Psalms, the psalmist said, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. This is, this is what Jesus would say, my close friend, because we're getting ready to look at his close friend. He was saying, for this reason I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. I don't have a PowerPoint for you, but John chapter 1, verse 12, one of my favorite verses, says to those, to those who believe, 
He gave the right to become children of God. And a lot of people like to misinterpret that and say, well, if you believe, it says you become a child of God. That is not what that verse said. It said, those who believe he gave the right to become children of God. There's some other things that go along with this. But the bottom line is this. Because there's so much argument about who gets saved, who can get saved, who can't get saved. God made some people to be saved. He made some not to be saved. uh, And they're going to go to hell and have no chance of being saved. And and then there's no choice to it. And Although the Bible says all the way through the Bible that we have to make a choice. Here's the bottom line. It's a simple question. It's not complicated. I could use a big word. Is God omniscient? Which means, does God know everything? Anybody have a problem with that? God knows everything. Okay? Let's just take this from square one. If God knows everything, and he does, did God know before creation... Every person that was ever going to accept him and stay the course and live for him and become a disciple of his and be saved. Did he know before creation? He had to if he knew everything. Then the Bible says no one can come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws them. Let me ask you a simple question. This is not complicated. Why would God the Holy Spirit, draw somebody, try to draw them to him that he already knows are going to reject him. Grace. Grace. If he knows they're going to reject him, God is not going to keep drawing and keep drawing and keep drawing because every time they reject him, their punishment gets worse and worse and worse. But God already knows those who are going to accept Him. And the Holy Spirit draws them. Now, there's some of us here. Here's one right here. He had to draw me for many years before I said yes. Well, I said yes as a young teenager, but I didn't mean it. I just wanted to God everybody else wanted. One that kept me out of hell and, you know, I could go to heaven. And, but, but He just, God knows. And he knows, God doesn't see you today. He doesn't see you where you are right now. God sees you where you're going to be. That's why some of us are still alive. I I do believe if God knew I was was never going to accept him and he knew I was going to continue to reject him, I believe I'd have died years ago like I should have many times in car. I should have been dead many times over the way I drove. But God looked down the road. Because see, down the road, with God, everything is right now. We We can't comprehend that. There is no past with God. There's no future with God. Everything with God is right now. So he said, I came for one reason. And the Holy Spirit, you can't come unless it's been granted by the Father. And the ones he grants by the Father, he knew in advance those who were going to accept him. He had to. Now, people want to argue that. Then they're saying God doesn't know everything. That's the only way you can argue that point. Now, people say, well, I, I, I... I really believe that I'm convicted. Well, now, there's a big difference between a conviction and a preference. A conviction is something you'll die for. If you're really convicted, you you believe in Jesus. We read, if you read the voice of the martyrs every month, we see people every month, we get stories about people overseas that they know they're going to die if they don't reject Jesus Christ. And they happily... Say, Jesus Christ is my Lord, knowing they're going to be have their throats cut, know they're going, their families are going to be killed. Folks, that's a conviction. There's a difference between a conviction and a preference. We need, we need to have a conviction that we believe in Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Savior, and nothing, no one, or anything is going to change that. And if we have to die for it, we'll die for it. If you won't die for it, you won't. If you and it, by the way, if you can't live for it, you won't die for it. So there's a difference between a conviction and a preference. A preference just fits your lifestyle. Oh, I'll take Jesus. That's what to do in India. They have so many different gods. Billy Graham, when first went over there, had to learn to change his invitation because he asked people who won't accept Jesus. They were all coming forth. Well, yeah, they'll take Jesus along with all their hundreds of other gods. No. No. We'll just put him up with the rest of our gods and 
He'll fit our lifestyle. That's the, by the way, that's the Jesus most people want. People don't have trouble with the baby Jesus in the cradle. And they, but they want the Jesus. When you start talking about following Jesus, they'll take Jesus as long as it fits their lifestyle. As long as I don't have to change the way I live, the way I think, the way I do think. I'll take Jesus. Oh yeah, I'll accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior as long as I don't have to change anything. Well, you just rejected Jesus. Amen. Folks, if Jesus doesn't change your life, you haven't gotten Jesus. When the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you, you're not going to be the same person you used to be. You're not going to think the way you used to think or act the way you used to act. Not when Jesus comes to live in. Because when the Holy Spirit's living in here, folks, you can't do some things you used to do because He won't let you. But let's look on. As a result of this, many of His disciples withdrew and were not walking with Him anymore. What did He just do? He just got through separating the sheep and the goats, didn't He? Those that, well, yeah, we're Christians. Well, as I said last week, I think it was last week or week before last, it's easy to be a Christian like but over there in China when they told them, you, you walk out that door, if you walk over that cross, you can live. If you won't walk over that cross, you're going to die. And the first six or seven walked out and bypassed the cross. And after that, the next girl bowed down, kneeled down beside the cross and refused to walk on the cross. And she died and everyone behind her did the same thing. That's a conviction. Many of his disciples withdrew. It's easy to be a Christian on Sunday morning, is it not? Folks, this is the easiest place in the world to be a Christian. Sunday morning in God's house. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away also? Do you? Well, they could be like Joshua when he had that question presented to him back in the Old Testament. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today who you'll serve. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And folks, that's what we need to say. We're living in a world around us right now that hates us, hates our church, and hates our Jesus. And we have to be willing to say, you can live the way you want to, and that's up to you. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Jesus said to the twelve, you know, don't go, you're going to go away. And Peter said, Lord, here it is. Here's the key. Here's the key passage for the whole message. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Were indeed. Where else? What's that song that Elvis did? Where could I go but to the Lord? But to the Lord. Well, where else can you go? Uh, uh, Hebrews, and it talks about in Hebrews 6, 4, and 6, that people that fall away and reject him, there's no other place to go. He said there's no longer any redemption because if you don't have Jesus, if you don't want Jesus, there is no second choice, folks. He's, either, he's it or he's nothing. He said he was the only way to the Father in John 14, 6. People say, well, I just need, I need Jesus in my life. I need Jesus. I just need Jesus to help me. Folks, I don't need Jesus too much to help me. I need Jesus to inhabit me. Amen. He will help you. But what we need is for Jesus to inhabit us. That's when your life changes. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Don't miss this. You've read this a hundred times. And you've never caught what I'm getting ready to tell you. One of you is a devil. Don't miss what he just said and what he didn't say. He did not say one of you is possessed by the devil. One of you is a demoniac that the devil is possessing and the devil is using. He said one of you is the devil. Judas wasn't just possessed by the devil. The devil, he had gone so far that the devil had Judas's heart. And he had become just like his father, the devil. In fact, there are some, and I, I, I won't 
I won't say pro or con on this, but some of the early fathers that I've been reading lately actually thought, a couple of them actually taught, and I think it was Eusebius maybe or Ignatius, I'm not sure, no, it was Papias, but they said that they thought that Judas was really the devil incarnate. He had taken over Judas's body, and that was the devil. And that's what Jesus was talking about here. Well, I can say one thing for sure. But scripture does tell me the, the, the devil had total control of Judas. He had sold out. He'd gone too far. He, and he, he had given his heart to the devil. Now, he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. But here's the sad thing. You know, we know Jesus wasn't a bit surprised. John chapter 13, verse 18. I said, I do not speak this to all of you. I know the ones I've chosen, Jesus talking. But it is the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread and lifted up his heel against me. He's quoting Psalm that we saw earlier. He knew who was going to betray him, and yet he allowed Judas to be the treasurer. He allowed Judas to, to dine with him. And I really believe when he leaned over and told Judas and gave him, dipped the bread and took the bite of the bread and gave it to Judas and said, Go do what you got, what you must do. Do it quickly. I do believe if Judas at that point had said, I can't do it, I repent, he'd have forgiven him just like that. I believe after Jesus died and after Judas came out of the temple and thrown the money back at him and came back out, and by the way, from what I'm reading right now, it looks like it, he didn't immediately go hang himself. It looks like there was a little time frame in there. Some other things happened to him before he went and hung himself. But the point is this. What happened when Peter denied Jesus three times? And Jesus was standing on the bank and the fishermen came in and Peter came up and they had the fish cooking there. And What did he ask Peter three different times? Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Oh, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Why did he ask him three times? How many times did he reject him? Not only did Jesus forgive Peter, who rejected him three times. Peter was the leader of the apostles after the resurrection. If Judas had come to Jesus and said, I was wrong, please forgive me. If he hadn't went and killed himself, if he'd have come to Jesus and asked him, and Jesus, has anybody ever sincerely ever asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins? And Jesus said no. Not one time. As bad as it was, if he'd have asked for forgiveness, he'd have gotten forgiveness. But his heart belonged to the devil. It was too late. He had given the devil permission to control him. The devil can't control you unless you give him permission. Jesus won't control you because he's a gentleman. The devil can't control you because he has to get permission. I've used the illustration many times, but if this piece of paper was our life and we wanted to give Jesus 99 and 9 tenths percent of it, and the devil would be perfectly satisfied if you just give him that little corner. Oh Jesus, I'll give you I'll give you 99 and 9 but I got this one little corner up here. Can I just hang on to it? And folks, the devil would be plenty satisfied. Because if you give the devil the corner and you give him control of that before long, he will have control of all of you. We can't compromise. Judas gave him control. If you were to sell me a piece of property, 
And then after I got my property, I lived right next door to you, and I started having parties and having loud music and throwing parties and doing all these things. And you, you come over and you say, wait a minute, this has got to stop. I said, well, I don't want to stop. Well, I'm going to make you so I'm going to force you off this property. Well, no, you can't. You sold me this property. I got the deed right here. This is my property. You sold it to me. This is mine. It's no longer yours. You can't do a thing about it. And you couldn't legally, you could not legally move me off that property because you had sold it to me. When you start making compromises and giving the devil permission to have control of part of your life, he won't stop with part of it. He wants your soul. And if you give him permission, he'll take it. But he can't get past Jesus. For the devil to get control of you, he has to get past Jesus. That's why the Bible says that no man can serve two masters. You serve one, you hate the other. You can't serve both. You'll be devoted to one, you'll hate the other. Folks, don't give the devil a stronghold. Don't let him in. Don't compromise. He'll tell you it's a little compromise. He told Eve it was a little compromise. Oh, it's just a fruit on the tree. Well, you can go eat that fruit and be just like God. Just a little compromise. And it's been costing us ever since. The hardest thing you will ever do in your life is walk with Jesus. Anybody that tells you it's easy is lying to you. That's a lie straight from hell. The hardest thing you will ever do is walk with Jesus, but it's the most satisfying and the most rewarding thing you will ever do. Amen. Now, you can, you can have your temporary happiness here and what the devil has to offer, or you can have permanent happiness there and what Jesus has to offer, but you can't serve two masters. Amen. That's why that word anxiety means to be torn. Be torn. Be torn. This master or that master. Jesus made it perfectly clear. He said, the words I give you are eternal life. You have the words of eternal life if you'll just listen. He said, I'm the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Master but by me. Folks, walk with Jesus. Trust Him. Let Him have control of your life. Quit trying to do it yourself. He can do a whole lot better job with it than you ever will. And He wants to. He wants what's best for you. He loves you more than you love yourself. And He wants you to be happy. And if you'll just trust Him, believe what He says, trust Him, you can have eternal life with Jesus Christ. No compromise. Words of eternal life.